Hello, welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all of the masterpieces and trash pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. And we are moving on from Valentine specials to uh, one of my favourite topics on this podcast, the Women in Horror Month. Yes. Which, uh, and I have said on this podcast many times before, it used to be an official month, uh, but now I believe it is just Women in Horror Movement. So we're just going to continue to celebrate great horror films directed by women. Yeah. Yeah. Directed by, you know, written by... Yeah. You know, uh, mainly directed by but women having a, a, a greater presence within horror. Obviously, women have always been part of the horror genre, but usually just uh, actresses dying on screen. Well, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's be fair here, or, you know, damsels in distress, or, you know, quick TNA. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're not totally against that sort of thing. We discussed many films that, you know, have all of that. But it's important to realise that women should have a greater voice in the horror genre. Yeah, and last year, specifically, we saw a massive rise in horror made by women, whether written, directed, or even produced, you know, I'm pretty sure... Majority of my top 20 horror films last year were, at the very least, produced by women. Um, we are not talking about anything from last year, though. We're taking it back to 1985. Yes. Where you have discovered a bit of a hidden gem. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit of a hidden gem. Uh, 1985, not really known for progressive horror films. And I, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a progressive or... A, a feminist horror film, but mm. the fact that it's 1985 and it's directed by a woman, you know, speaks for itself. Yeah. You know, it was a time when women didn't direct films full stop, let alone horror films or genre films. And so it's really refreshing to, to see a film, you know, it, it doesn't force a message. It doesn't have to force a message. No? It's giving the director, Roberta Finley, a chance to make a horror film. Mm -hmm. It's saying, we believe in your abilities to do this. Here's some money. Go out and make it. Yeah. And she made a, a fun film. She did. She made The Oracle. Yes. Uh, and I would actually say this could potentially be a feminist film, especially with the ending. Um, throughout the film, you get a lot of the classic women being gaslit, whilst uh, trying to tell their husbands that there's something going on and so on. But, spoiler alert, the woman gets the last laugh here, and a very good for her ending. Yes. Yeah, that's technically true. Also, really weird, random fact from me, um, because I've watched these films so many times that I've noticed these things, uh, a fair few things in the Paranormal Activity franchise were taken from this film. What, what like? Uh, so the Ouija board uh, joke scene, obviously not a Ouija board because I couldn't afford a Ouija board with the rights. Uh, the joke scene where it's like, oh, the ghost is saying I'm horny. Like that is exactly recreated in Paranormal Activity 2. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously the whole woman talking about a paranormal goings on. It's done in many films, but it is done in Paranormal Activity. Mm. Um, yeah, I kind of feel like they may have taken a few things from this and been a little like, well, no one's going to know. No, that's been inspired no by one's it. seen it. I don't think this film is the most original film on the planet. I don't think it is. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, like, that which was seen specifically is very yeah. much taken yeah. directly from this. Um, this has only been rated by, like, 690 people, something like that, on IMDb, with a shocking 4.1. Absolutely undeserved 4.1. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a tad harsh. I do, I do think that's a tad there's, harsh. There's a section of this film that is 4.1 material, but only a small section when the rest of it is just so much fun. And I genuinely believe if this was directed by a man, this would be a cult classic now. This is the sort of thing that a lot of horror fans love from back in the 80s. Uh, the whole thing feels like one big Tales from the Crypt episode. And it's just relentlessly fun. And, you know, similar to the likes of Creep Show, you know, the Monster Squad, and just that sort of campy, fun 80s tone um, that people usually love. But this is just unheard of, this film. Yeah, yeah. I think it's quite similar to an earlier film that I'm not going to mention because it's my If You Enjoyed This. 
I think I know what you're going to say. And I think it's quite similar. The, the, the early film took it a little more seriously, but that was directed by man and is seen as a cool classic. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll discuss that. This is dir- no spoilers. This is directed by Roberta Finlay, yes. uh, who directed The Altar of Lust, Love in Strange Places, Rosebud, Take Me Naked, Blood Sisters, Kinky Tricks, Fantasex, The Clam Digger's Daughter, Take My Head, and more. Now, yes, I know what you're thinking. Roberta Finlay was indeed a porn director. Yes. With, like, five horror films thrown in. Yeah, yeah. So Roberta Finley, she did a lot of cinematography for her ex-husband's films, and they divorced in nineteen seventy-seven. Um, I can't remember his name. I haven't got it written down. Isn't that terrible? Um, oh, this is women in horror, so forget. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, she did a lot of cinematography, and then she directed a lot of porn films with and, and without him, and continued to, even after the divorce, continued to work, and then. He died, and she continued, and she did films like The Oracle. Yeah. And written by R. Alan Leader, who wrote Glitter. No, not the Mariah Carey one. A oh, no. film. Liquid Assets. Okay. Star Angel and Sex Capades. So this, is ri- this, this film was made by a porn crew. And mm. I admit, I said to Chris, wait a minute. We've chose a film, an 80s horror film for 4.1 on IMDb. Written by a porn crew starring little known actors, this is gonna be a fucking disaster. Like this, <laughs> I w- I had the lowest expectations for this, but surprised me, really surprised me. Well, that's how it was back in the day, wasn't it? There were just two kind of films you could do on the cheap and make some sort of profit from. Yeah, and that was horror films and porn films. So they they kind of knew their audience. I don't think the audiences are too dissimilar. No, really, um, straight guys in their you know early 20s to 40s yeah. <laughs> you know I uh, don't know the budget don't know how much it made there's hardly any information about this film online mm. um, but one fact I do have is that it was a lot more graphic in its original cut and uh, it was cut due to the MPAA but do you know what that surprises me because this is pretty fucking gory yeah there was some good kills in it actually surprisingly Shall we talk about who's in it, even if there isn't many people? <laughs> yeah. Um, in a section we're calling today, hey, I don't think I know you. Yeah, I literally have two people of note mm. <laughs> in this entire cast. Um, I have Pam Latesta, who plays Farkas. Mm. Uh, she was in Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, Don't Mess With My Sister, Blood Sisters, My Secret Billionaire, and Suffering Bastards, and more. Oh, my. Irma St. Paul... Or Polly, as her spout, uh, plays Mrs. Malatista. She was in 12 Monkeys, Finna, Homicide, Life on the Street. Wow. Trees Lounge, uh, Sex and the City. Wow, the Steve Buscemi directed film. Yeah, Sex and the City, Party wow. Girl, and more. And who did she play? Mrs. Malatista. Who is I that the assume old lady, is the the old lady at the beginning. Oh, okay. Is that some sort of cameo then or something? I mean, potentially. I mean, she... It, spoiler alert. She's only in one scene. Yeah. That's all I've got for you, though. No one else... Everyone else has either only acted in this film or acted in so little else that it wasn't worth writing down. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's a low budget for you. Yeah. I mean, for some people it kind of shows. Some of them. Some of them. Some of them. <laughs> Uh, shall we talk about a feature presentation? Yes. Jennifer was desired and then seduced. Now the horror begins and no one can stop it. She doesn't know the danger it will foretell or the evil it will unleash. Jennifer, are you all right? No. The Oracle. The horror has begun. What the hell are you doing in there? Jenny! We start with the opening credits over an old lady who I'm, I'm assuming is Mrs. Uh, Maltista. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. she's an old psychic lady in a basement. Um, you know. Yes. Is she in a basement? I don't know where she is. I don't know where this place is. Um, she's spelling more day using a plastic hand holding a feather pen. 
Uh, the plastic hand we'll soon come to know is the Oracle, the film's title. I don't think it's meant to be plastic, but okay. It, well, <laughs> it's very clearly plastic. Uh, it starts moving by itself, and she informs the ghost that she could not help them, and a card starts burning. Uh, the Parker brothers wouldn't let the filmmakers use their Ouija board in the film, so Roberta Findlay had to come up with the uh, oh the, the stone spirit hand instead. Stone, stone not plastic. It's, it's stone. Stone. Um. Yeah, this is absolutely taken from a mannequin. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's it does look stone, but it also looks a little like it's been glittered. The rights for using a Ouija board, oh my God, it's been used in so many worse films than this. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose so. I assume the Parker Brothers weren't around when Ouija was made. Uh, no, but the, the filmmakers for Ouija probably offered them a lot more money than Roberta Finley That's did true. for the Oracle. That's true. And I mean, it kind of just does the same thing anyway. It does, it does. Uh, we're introduced to Pappas with his beefy moustache. And I mean, it's a solid 11 out it's of 10. A, it's a good moustache. Uh, he has a very open shirt as well, and a big hairy chest. Yeah. Um, and he's taken something heavy away in a chest. Uh, and then makes a comment about the old lady who lived there before. Yeah, um... Strangely funky music playing that yeah. we then realise is on a sort of cassette player. <laughs> but I didn't realise it. Like, is this the soundtrack? <laughs> like, why are we getting such funky music? I know he's got a big moustache and a hairy chest, but is that really necessary? <laughs> We're introduced to uh, our final girl of the piece. Yes. Jennifer. Jennifer, what's she wearing as we're introduced? What's she wearing? Bright red dungarees. <laughs> yes. She is... She makes some choices. She does. She makes some fashion choices throughout the film. She... Some good, some not so great. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely put her in the fashion icon category, especially with a certain look later on in the film. Yeah, well, she's not afraid to take chances. No. And you, you've got to admire that. Yeah. Um. So she's in... What I thought was the basement of what I thought was a house. I think it's a block of flats. I really, I'm not sure. I think it's an apartment in an apartment yeah. building because that's when you would have a superintendent. So, um, what's his name? I can't remember. His Pappas. Name. Pappas. He is the superintendent. There. Yeah. So he does all the fixing of stuff and helping them mm-hmm. out in that sense. Yeah. Um, so she's, yeah, she's moving into this new apartment, yeah. um, and, uh, it's revealed to be the one belonging to the lady in the opening scene, and she discovers something with a green glow, uh, that looks like it's in the same chest that Papas was carrying. Yeah, so Jennifer knows that she's in a horror film. She does. So she decides not to turn on the lights to go and check out this creepy chest where the lights are emanating from. <laughs> And then gets a nice jump scare from uh, Pappas. Yeah, for only the first of two times in this film, um, she walks backwards and bumps into a man. This actually she's, happens yes. twice. Yeah. Um, this time it's Pappas. Happens and to me all the time. D- Jennifer finds the hand with the feather pen and Pappas informs her that it's called the Oracle. It's a quill. Hun. It's a feather quill. Pen, okay, yeah, great. Quill. Um, clearly I'm uneducated. <laughs> uh, and uh, is used to talk to the dead and that the lady who lived there previously taught him how to use it. But he shows Jennifer how to use it. We then cut... To, the editing in this film is bizarre. It, it <laughs> is. It is. You don't he, know where the scenes end. <laughs> he's, he randomly says that... Well, no. he Well, he does randomly say it. But also the old lady randomly disappeared. Yeah. So there was nothing left of her. No. And I don't know how long ago this was. Yeah. This is this is my confusion. <laughs> don't expect any backstory. In no, this and there's a few timeline continuity yeah. issues. My first one being that seemingly the old lady wasn't able to help the spirit mm-hmm. that is the at the center of the film. Now that spirit only became a spirit three weeks previous. <laughs> so they've managed to not find this woman, but then just sold her apartment willy nilly. Without her there, in it's, three weeks, it's true. And, and also, they moved in, and it's just like moving her stuff. What's more day, by the way? <laughs> I think it's Latin, and I, I thought it said murder. It said more day. 
Morde. So Morde is something to do with death. I think it yeah. means murder. I think it's Latin for murder. You should have said Morde. That's exactly what it said. And that's what she repeated as well. Murder. So, yeah, I mean, I they're assuming that we can translate that. Okay, that's great. Um. <laughs> well, it, it actually... I mean, <laughs> she must speak Latin because, spoiler alert, when the same thing's communicated to Jennifer, it says murder. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly she can't speak Latin. Well... A very impatient prostitute called Tammy. Yes. She, she has got no time for anyone. She wants her money. She wants her business done. And she wants them out of there. Well, you know what? We stand a queen who wants to get things do. done. We do. Uh, she informs a customer that it's $20 an hour with no kinky stuff. Uh, her customer tells her to lie down. They climb on top of her and seemingly blows a whistle. Did you hear that? Or was it? No. You didn't hear the whistle? I didn't know. Maybe it was someone outside our flat then. Maybe. Um, but I heard a whistle. Uh, she asks the customer if they're gay or something. Reaches into their trousers and it's revealed it's a woman. Yeah, not obviously. No. This is one... Uh, one thing is that the, the murderer in this film is a woman. Yeah. And Seemingly a butch lesbian. Y- yes, because... Um, I mean... We don't like conforming to gender stereotypes, but she is mistaken for a man on many occasions Mm -hmm. because of the way she's dressed. And even in this case, with the prostitute, she's mistaken for a man. When the zipper comes down, that's when the prostitute finds out that it's not a man. Mm -hmm. Um, Then the prostitute's murdered. (laughs) So technically, I mean, she is gay or something. Yeah, seemingly, <laughs> seemingly, yes, yes, because um, later on in the film, she also says about having her way with Jennifer before killing her off. Yeah. I mean, it's not the best gay representation. <laughs> no, uh, no. Very, very 1985. Uh, but, yeah, it also isn't massively... I, I mean, it's it's not great, but for 1985 standards, it's not massively distracting. No, because it's kind of not dealt with no it's kind of particularly from jennifer she mistakes her as a man at the uh, when she sees flashbacks to the murder and then when realizing she's a woman she doesn't actually make a big deal of it no <laughs> she literally just says well i thought it was a man turns out it was a woman so it, it just cracked on it's just <laughs> like it didn't make a big deal of it I mean, personally, I'm hoping Jennifer is uh, bisexual herself because I'd very much like her on our team. Okay. Just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the customer's called Farkas. Mm-hmm. Uh, she handcuffs uh, the prostitute and forces her to lick a knife before stabbing her to death. The role of Farkas was originally written for a man, mm. but Pam Latista uh, came to the audition with her boyfriend and introduced herself to the director... And Finley was so impressed with Latista that she cast her in the part. Yeah. Of her boyfriend. Well, that's good. I mean, she got a paycheck. Yeah. You know. It's breaking, breaking boundaries and genders. role for you know? women in the film. You don't get that many female killers, really. They get a prominent role. Um. So, yeah. I mean. Yeah, it's, it's got its pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, you know, the fact that we have someone who's not a, a feminine female character... And like you said, a female killer. That's always, you know, a nice change. But at the same time, you know, the lesbian representation isn't exactly the best. Of course, yes. Um, Silent Night plays as Farkas cleans her knife. And it's revealed that this is actually a Christmas film. Yes, technically. Yeah. Yeah. She and says, uh, she's Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Tammy. Tammy. Yeah, and leaves. Uh, when she goes onto the street, a drug dealer approaches her. He's like, hey, buddy, you want to buy some joint or some coke? <laughs> Uh, but then realises that Farkas is apparently completely hideous and walks away. Oh, a woman. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> back in the apartment, Papas says, I must say, it's very nice to have young people here after the old lady who lived here. I have to go now. Have a nice Christmas. Merry Christmas. No, have a nice night. Merry Christmas. Yeah, so it's earlier on, Jennifer had invited Papas to a party. <laughs> And apparently this is the party, I think. Yeah. Because she says, oh, do you want to stay, Papas? Because he's helped her get everything together. He says, oh, no, it's fine. You enjoy yourselves. 
number one, there's only four <laughs> chairs around that table <laughs> and only four play settings. <laughs> so that's pretty disingenuous for Jennifer to say, well, why don't you join us? Uh, well, you have to sit on the sofa. Um, also, I assumed the gentleman... Is a one-time actor. Playing Pappas <laughs> is, number one, a one-time actor. Number two, not Greek. I don't know, actually. I, do you think? I, I'm not sure. This, this is sometimes the problem with films, is that obviously, if he is Greek, he's been told to really put on a strong accent. Yeah, his line delivery is, is something else. Which in itself it's... is a bit... I mean, if anyone's seen Shirley Valentine, it's given Tom Conti in Shirley Valentine levels of Greek accent. Well, I mean, his name is Chris Maria de Corin. So... I don't think that's a Greek surname. I mean, I will, I will find out if I can. I don't, I don't think it's a Greek surname. Either way, if he's Greek or not Greek, I he don't think act. I don't think that he can't act, and I don't <laughs> I don't think he talks like that in real life. No, there's, there's no. Uh, this was his only film. Yeah. Um, but it's also quite rude that she, you know, has invited him, put the invite out there, but only set places at the table for four people. Yeah, and that would be her, her husband Ray, his colleague. Slash maybe brother, because they look exactly the fucking same, Ben, and his wife, Cindy, who yeah. is uh, Jennifer's best friend. Yeah, so Ben and Ray, their moustaches are, you know, they're giving Papa some room for his money. Yes. Um, every man in this film has to have a moustache. Every single man I'm a in fan. this film. It's the only way that we knew that Farkas was a woman. Yeah. Was because she didn't have a moustache, because every single man in this film... Has a mustache. Yeah, um, I'm absolutely here for it. Oh, it's... yeah, living for it. You could tell it's made by a porn crew. If that's the type of people oh, they're hiring. Clearly, of course. I do have a problem though because it's difficult to know who the yeah no is who. the f- the three um the three white men all look the exact same. <laughs> yeah. Farkas uh, goes to a diner and orders the Christmas special. A phone rings in the diner, and she answers it, and uh, the waitress is like, Hey, what is this? Your private office? <laughs> and uh, Varkas is like, You got some mouth on you. <laughs> Back at Jennifer's house... Well, what does the... Uh, Varkas, for some reason, stabs a happy Hanukkah balloon... <laughs> yes. ...after the phone call. And Varkas, do you think that's the actress's voice? I don't know. I, th- I don't know because... It... it feels like it is the actress's voice, but she's putting her voice on. Yeah. It also feels like it's kind of badly dubbed. It's a, it's a weird one. I mean, it probably is regardless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but back at Jennifer's house, uh, she pulls out the Oracle for a classic white people in a new house and a horror film party game. Of course. Let's talk to the dead. <laughs> uh, we cut back to the diner, though. Well, Farkas is still on the phone, and she's like, oh yeah? Well, don't be late. It's fucking cold out there. Yeah. <laughs> what accent are you? Uh, slightly New Jersey. Slightly New Jersey. Can you tell me if you're watching the new series of New Jersey? Hey, I'm cold here. Uh, Jen, Ray, and their friends start playing with the Oracle in the same way they'd use the Ouija board, of course. Of course. And it writes, I am horny. And uh, it doesn't actually. It's Cindy playing a joke. She's like, I, yeah, A, M, H, O, R, N, Y, and which is weird because it may it obviously this was written, yeah, with the idea that it would be a Ouija board, uh huh, because Ouija boards spell things out, yeah. So she's writing on but, a piece of paper. But this is just writing on a piece of paper. What I find hilarious, and it's very very obvious. That the actress playing Jennifer is just pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> obvious. Oh my god, do you know what it's like? Do you know what it reminds me of? What? <laughs> Most haunting. Oh Most haunting. God. Most haunted. Yeah. Live at the um the place where the witch is. I'm I'm doing my research right now as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> where Yvette gets possessed and she's doing the automatic handwriting. Yeah. And 
it, it spells out like random shit. Um, I oh god, where was it? It was um, where's the place in the UK where they had witches? Pendle Hill. Oh yeah, yeah. Pendle Hill. Um, yeah, and she's there in a the bedroom, a fucking her hair's flying everywhere. She's doing her automatic handwriting. She's possessed. That, that's exactly what this film is. It is, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, actually, but more camp. In, in earlier, she said, tap the fucking table. <laughs> um, Jennifer is absolutely fuming uh, with, um, with with Cindy. 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 Cindy doing her automatic camera, doing her best Yvette Fielding impression. She's fuming. And she's like, please don't do this. It isn't right. <laughs> Farkas, meanwhile, leaves the diner. <laughs> and when, he, when she leaves the diner, the waitress is like, holy shit. He ate the bones too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel kind of sorry for Farkas. I mean, you know, she's misgendered. She's had a bit of homophobic hate already. She's just trying to live a life. And she's just, I mean, this is why she started murdering people. This is her Joker origin story. Okay, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> she murders for money apart from the prostitute. And I don't know why she murders the prostitute. It's never really explained. Because she was homophobic to her. I don't think she was. Hey, you gay or something? <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Oracle starts moving. And by the way, I, I shit you not, this isn't my messy notes. This is how fast the film moves between scenes. Yeah. The Oracle starts moving whilst Jennifer's hand is on it and writes, help me. And Ray is fuming and gives her a talent off in the bedroom. Oh, Ray. It's like, what can you add a little more like Cindy, eh? It's like a little okay, more... He doesn't talk like that. <laughs> it's like a little more positive, assertive. And she's like, well, I'm not Cindy. I'm me. I'm like, yes, queen. He says, yes, you're you always whimpering. I mean, she is, to be fair. But hey, you always whimper. She is. <laughs> she is a bitch she of really this is. film. It's only when she gets a certain part, a certain piece of clothing yeah. that she stops. Um, but you'd be whimpering <laughs> if you were married to Ray. Well, that's oh. true. He's awful. Uh, he accuses her of wanting attention with the Oracle and suggests they start a family so she has something to concentrate on. They have a kiss, but she doesn't want to take it any further, and Ray is fuming. He's so he, even more he goes pissed. To sleep. Uh, and this is very much my thing here, so I think this is a feminist film. He's very much like, oh yeah, we have to have kids for our life to have a purpose. And Jennifer's like, no, fuck off. I'm focusing on my new career as a psychic. Leave me alone. <laughs> she didn't really have a career, did she? She's well, not a career woman. Okay, she's living her best life, trying to solve murder mysteries with a psychic hand, and she doesn't want to have kids. So, fair play to her. Now, this is a little confusing because obviously they've gone to bed now and that was a Christmas Eve dinner. It yes. was. Christmas Eve dinner. So later on in the evening, Jennifer is awoken by a flashing green light and scratching noises from the planchette, which is the oracle, uh, writing out the words, help me again. Oh, help me again. No, yeah. no, no. This time it gives her 40. Who? It gives her the entirety that she needs to solve the rest of the mystery for the film. Oh, but does it help me again? No. This handwriting's terrible. No, we actually, yeah, it's really bad, and we can never see what it says until the character reads it out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it gives the full lowdown yeah. on William Graham, doesn't it? Yeah, it's like, hey, hun, uh, so this is what you need to know for the rest of the film. Now, what, how does she say what does it mean? It's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> So she walks backwards again for the second time in the film and bumps into a man again. This time it's Ray. I said, the board gave me another message. What am I going to do? What does it mean? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> and uh, he's like, right, well, I'll get rid of this piece of shit. Yeah. And he doesn't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> he? We, she... then, we then cut. Now, this I was a little confused <laughs> by. Jennifer and her friend, Cindy go shopping for what looks like Victorian clothing. She Okay, she is dressed like a Victorian she ghost is, girl. As Jennifer is also <laughs> dressed like a Victorian. It's given the ghastly ones. <laughs> what is she wearing? But also, I thought, with the amount of racks they're going through in the shop and moving things around, I thought they worked there. I thought they worked there. <laughs> so I said, she discusses what happened on Christmas Eve. And she refers to it as Christmas Eve. She didn't say yesterday. Yeah. She says Christmas Eve. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Christmas is gone. It's Christmas Day. They're shopping. Well, that's seemingly <laughs> not. Because obviously the, the way they say Christmas Eve, um, with Cindy and how the planchette gave the name of William Graham. So she says that to Cindy. 
and they decide to call him. Yeah, because this the, William Graham. Yeah, because the ghost also wrote his phone number on there. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> And so it turns out, after they call, that Mr. Graham had committed suicide three weeks ago. Okay, this is where I'm confused. As they are shopping for Victorian clothing, Christmas music is still playing. (laughs) So what fucking day is it? Hey, Christmas isn't over until January 5th. That's not true. You don't hear Christmas music after Christmas Day. (laughs) It's ridiculous. So they're either shopping on Christmas Day, which is highly unlikely... They may work, be working in this Victorian <laughs> clothing shop. <laughs> it's, it's hard to tell. But either way, I, I think that the soundtrack is wrong <laughs> and it should not be Christmas music because Christmas is over with. Well, But it's not past New Year's Day because New Year's party, spoiler alert, is coming up. That's true. So why, why, what are they doing? I, Where I don't are know. they? They've gone back in time. They've gone uh, back to Victorian times. <laughs> well, she also says that her living room smelled like dead roses, and Cindy suggests that it could be a Chinese restaurant. Okay, first of all, since when do Chinese restaurants smell like dead roses? And second, there's none to suggest she lives near a Chinese restaurant. Did one just grow legs and fucking walk to her apartment? No, she said that the phone number might be for a Chinese restaurant. No, 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 no. Rest- no she no, said no, the no. smell was... She said no. She said that the phone number might be for a Chinese restaurant. I swear she said it was a dead rose's smell. No. Okay, well, then that's just poorly placed dialogue. Yeah, no, it, it, of course it is. Uh, no, but she she does... It, it's like, oh, give it a call. It might be a Chinese restaurant. Yeah, so between when she says give it a call, that's when... Um, Jennifer says, oh, it smelled like dead roses in there. And then she's like, probably a Chinese restaurant. No. That doesn't make any sense. I know that. <laughs> that's where it was, though. Okay, if that's how you heard it, I won't gaslight you. Cindy it's calls... In film. Cindy calls the number on a paper and asks for William Graham. And she's told by his wife, Dorothy... That William committed suicide three weeks ago. Uh, we cut to Dorothy, who is fucking serving a look at her desk. Do you know what she's serving? What she's serving? Jodie Foster. She is. She's definitely... She has just got the money from his death. And she's got herself a nice outfit. She's got her own office now. You know, she's having a great time. Uh, she informs Tom, yet another man with a moustache who looks identical specifically to Ray. Oh my god. So um, confusing. That someone was calling and asking for Bill, and she seems really concerned about it. Back at Jennifer's house, the Oracle starts writing again. Jennifer throws it in a bin and looks so satisfied with herself, which causes the lights to start flickering and everything in the room to go fucking crazy, falling over, being thrown at her. Uh, fair play to the actress playing Jennifer because, I mean... She is acting like she's being dragged. She's having random shit thrown in her face constantly. The camera's and tilted. Yeah, she's still... She is giving it her everything. It's she's her only film, and she's giving it her all. Bless that. She's trying her best. It's not working, but she's trying her best. And that's, you know, well, that's you've got to give so. credit there. Something that annoyed me, and it annoys me in real life, and it annoys me in films. She gets the box with the oracle in mm-hmm. and throws it into a bin. Yeah. And it's a little wicker bin. Mm -hmm. Like a general office waste bin. Yeah. And it fills the whole bin up. (laughs) And the bin is like a foot away from where the box box was anyway. (laughs) And it drives me insane. It it genuinely drives me absolutely insane. In real life and in films. When people throw away something in a bin that's just as big as as what they're throwing away. So what's the point? You're going to have to fucking empty that bin anyway, so you might as well... T- you can't fit anything else in the bin. It's true. Drives it's true. me absolutely bonkers. It's up there with unattended candles. My gripes. Uh, do, do we both love how the Oracle is a camp icon? Uh, like, Jennifer throws the Oracle in the bin, basically calls the Oracle trash, and the Oracle's mm. like, fuck you, bitch. I am going to fucking throw your living room Shit at you. Trash. <laughs> yes. But the best part is but the also reason. A rich old white man. Yeah, but I mean, do we know that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's Graham. Yeah, but it's the... William Graham. Yes, but the hand isn't exclusively belonging to William Graham. Any yes, spirit it can is. possess it. 
Well, maybe William Graham was gay then because... That's he's, William Graham. He's acting like a gay icon. He's doing spins and this, tricks. This is where I'm confused because William Graham was murdered three weeks previous. Yes. Yeah. The old lady was seemingly telling William Graham that she couldn't help him. Don't know why. I mean, I don't actually remember <laughs> him asking Jennifer. <laughs> don't, you know, without forcing her to help. You know? Do you know well, what I mean? She's feeling like Angela Lansbury. She wants to help. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, the hand starts doing fucking spins on, on the paper, just not even writing over it, it's just spinning, uh, and it is a camp visual, like the fucking Christmas trees being thrown at Jennifer, tinsels being thrown at her, the entire kitchen, the books, the go books. Flying. <laughs> fucking they move a shelf in front of the door so Ray can't get hit, so he can't get in, but he eventually gets in, um, and, uh, and when he does... He, of course, doesn't believe her, and uh, he decides to throw away the oracle, but bumps into Papas on his way to do so, and Papas takes it off him for his own personal use. Yes, he does. Yeah. So Papas, this is also something I'm quite confused by, because Ray goes to take it to an incinerator, Uh huh. and it's a room called Incinerator. Now, an incinerator <laughs> is somewhere where rubbish is burnt. Yeah. Now, number one, I don't think they have them in apartment buildings. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. But, like, a large fire that's easily accessible, you know? A very, very confusing. Yeah. But actually, in the incinerator room is a chute. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a rubbish chute. Yeah. So I don't think there's an incinerator there. No. Like, really? I don't know why it's called an incinerator. You know, we never see it. No. Uh, but Popas does he does keep it for himself. Yeah. Um he wants it because he's fed up of losing at the lottery and wants the spirit to give him the lottery numbers yeah. for the next day. Yeah, so he tries to use it, he just keeps shouting at it, spitting on it. Um and the Oracle is not having this at all. Like it's been for a rough time recently. Uh so it opens on its own. A green slime creature falls out of it. The creature attaches itself to Papas's leg. Things start growing out of his fucking arm and he starts stabbing himself. Now, this was obviously made on a shoestring budget. Mm. These practical effects are fantastic. They are, actually. Of, of the whatever creature this is, and I'm still confused as to why there's a creature in this film. I, I really I'm, don't get it. I'm not complaining. Um, or, or why this creature goes around killing people <laughs> when he's trying to solve his own murder. But... um. The effects on his arm and him stabbing himself are actually pretty good for yeah. a low budget film. Yeah. yeah, even like the rest of the film, the special mm. effects are so good. So the idea is that he's only visualizing yeah. these and it's not real, so he ends up stabbing himself repeatedly and dying. Yeah, which is very Hellraiser 2, which came out a few years after this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's happened in a lot of films, though, to be fair. I wouldn't say... Okay, can we please give this film some credit, please? Well, and pretend for a I'm second that it no influenced the films. no one saw the, the fucking thing. <laughs> Clive Barker probably seen it. I can imagine. It's... I know he didn't direct how I was too, did he? I swear he wrote it, though, didn't he? Anyway. Um, yeah. Unless it was ba- but it was, wasn't it based on his books? Oh, potentially. Look, so maybe I'm just trying to Roberta give... Finley had read the well, books. Well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he stabs himself to death. Jennifer and Ray are getting it on. Um, Jennifer, her orgasm, mm. I, I shit you not, she's there like, mm, 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 yeah? mm, mm. Mm. <laughs> Definitely your noise. It sounds like she's just agreeing Genuinely, she sounds like she's having a conversation where she's not paying yeah. attention and she's just agreeing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why she's with Ray. He gives weak dick. He is so rude. He gaslights her. He must be rich. Though. Hasn't even he got worked... the best mustache in the film. He works for the um, news outlet, doesn't he? He works for he... TV. Who this... knows? Who the fuck knows where anyone works in this film? He must film? have some money in the bank. <laughs> well, apparently. Um, they fall asleep. Well, also, whilst she's getting railed. <laughs> barely. Barely getting railed. <laughs> God bless her. He decides it's the best time to tell Jennifer that he told her so about getting rid of the box. <laughs> well, I told you so. I told you to be better. Look, you want to sleep with me now? You got rid of the box. Yeah. Everything's fine now. I told you so. Like, it's not really 
you're, you're inside her. Can <laughs> you not try and uh, degrade her like that? Yeah, but it gets him off because he's an asshole. Uh, Jennifer already falls asleep with a TV on. Uh, she wakes up with a skull on the TV and the green light in her room. So she stumbles around in a bed and starts screaming. Um, the skull disappears. She goes to the bathroom and giant creature starts clawing at the shower curtain. <laughs> Again, inexplicably, I don't know what this creature's about. She or tries or. to escape, but she's locked in. But she eventually leaves and finds Papas with a knife in his eye walking towards her in the living room. But it was all a dream. Yeah, so she had two bad dreams. And Ray's like, oh, you crazy bitch. It's a dream within a dream. Yeah. Ray, well, he's initially comforting her. Oh, you've had a bad dream. And then when it comes to breakfast time <laughs> the next day, he's a proper twat again. He blames it on her watching too much late night TV. Yeah. Uh, and the ghost pushes Ray's coffee cup onto the floor. And then he's like, oh, Jeff, you look terrible. I'm going to work. Yeah, well, he does say, uh, why don't you go back to bed? Yeah. Um, I didn't think she looked terrible. No. The, the thing is with Jennifer is that no matter what time of night it is, no matter whether she's been woken <laughs> from slumber, she's being chased by inanimate objects or a, a large wind. She's got a face full of makeup <laughs> and her hair's always done. <laughs> so, credit to you. The oracle appears on the dining room table under raised newspaper. <gasps> In work, yeah, because apparently he works at some sort of TV station. Yeah. Um, ben brings Ray a file about William Graham's suicide, and Ray's like, oh, you're fucking kidding me. That's fucking bullshit again. Um, but then Ben gets a call. <laughs> yeah. This is our series of events. Ben gets a call informing him that Papa's has been murdered. <laughs> yeah. Why does he get a fucking call? <laughs> because he works, he's a reporter. Yeah, but. But they're all reporters. Are they? Yeah. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. It's, it's not really clear, so is it? Robot, and then he's, they're like, all oh, on the phone. He's like, where do you know where it is? I know where it is. That's my apartment <laughs> building. So seemingly Ben, to, to really confuse it, I swear they've wife they're swapped. the same building. They've definitely <laughs> wife swapped. Definitely. Ben and Ray and Cindy and Jennifer all live in the same apartment building. Oh, apparently. And that's when Ben is like, I know him. He's my superintendent. That's my apartment building. I'll get on the case right now. <laughs> So they go and do their investigative journalism. Yeah. Jennifer has a Ray and Simone moment. She does. She has a psychic vision. She gazes into the future. Uh, well, the well, past. She, gazes, she, gazes she gazes into, into the, the past, past. And she sees Tom and Farkas gassing William Graham inside his car <gasps> to make it look like it's suicide. Dun, dun, dun. Now, this is when this bitch means business. She fucking puts a beret on. She does. Puts a scarf on. She's a scarf gay. <laughs> fucking fancy outfit she goes to a magic shop and gets a man there to tell her the entire plot of the film yes <laughs> yeah he's an expert on the oracle <laughs> yeah so it's like an occult store isn't it it's, it's very much it's like the craft yeah um and a lot of these sort of films where you know someone is like oh i don't know about all this and they go to one person where or go to one shop where one person explains it. Like, oh, he yeah, knows definitely. every fucking detail mm. about this oracle. I mean, every tiny detail about it. Yes. And he gives her all of the exposition she needs to get through the rest of the film. Now she's in a detective era. Now, this man also has a moustache. Of course he does. And no acting talent. <laughs> and yeah, he wants her that the spirit of William Graham is communicating with her and could use her to enter the natural world. Uh-huh. Spoiler alert. He doesn't. <laughs> I've got a budget for that. Yeah. Um, Put the idea out there, but we're not actually going to do it. <laughs> yeah, very. It's um, it's very confusing because I don't understand this spirit of William Graham. He's trying to get justice for his murder. Yeah, I understand that. Why is he in turn murdering random people? <laughs> this is what I don't get. Like why? Why was Pappas killed? Like what? Because was the Pappas reason? pissed him off. Because he was just rude about he spat the on him. oracle. Still, it's so weird. He's a stone hand now, and he got spat on. It's not very nice. They didn't have enough murders, so they kind of had to make Farkas a murder, a prostitute murderer. The thing is, William Graham's dead. He's like, do you know what? Who gives a shit? I'm not going to get into trouble for this. I might as well. But why didn't he kill Jennifer? Because Jennifer was 
kind because of not very helpful to begin he with. He knows that she's going to become Until a gay she icon. Put a beret on. He, kn- he knew she was going to get the beret. He saw it in the apartment. He's like, she's going to put that on at some point. She's going to become a detective. She's going to become Jessica Fletcher. And she's going to go around, solve all this shit, and let me do my piece, what I need to do. So Jennifer berates Salon. She goes to visit Dorothy Graham and informs her all about her psychic visions of her husband being murdered. Yeah, Dorothy Graham's giving Jodie Foster in an episode of Dynasty, I felt. <laughs> well, yeah, she's, she is. She's giving Joan Collins, with a, but looking like Jodie Foster. Her outfit's slightly different to the last time we saw her, but still, you know, still slay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jennifer starts to explain the vision in great detail, and Dorothy pours her a drink. Now, I thought this was going somewhere. I thought, oh, she's going to, you know, she's going to drug her or something. No. Uh, Jennifer takes Dorothy to where it happened and starts yelling, Tom. Well, Dorothy takes Jennifer. Well, yeah, she the, tells the her. The funny thing is that Jennifer describes the place, and then, have you? do you know that place? And Dorothy's like, yes, that's where he was found. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I know where my husband's body was found. <laughs> I just find that weird. Like, do you know this place that I've just described? Uh-huh. Like, yeah. I mean, he didn't drive off <laughs> after being gassed in his car. That's where he was found. <laughs> That's where the car was. Like, I know the location of where my husband's okay. death. Beret Jennifer is doing her absolute best. I know she's doing Please her best. Please curse and slack. No one's perfect, <laughs> but that was fucking stupid. She thought she was being clever. And that's the main thing. I'm fully on her side. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was she's... outside the factory that he owned. Yeah, well, as yes, well. <laughs> we know. She's she's there. She's like Tom, 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 Dorothy. And then she pretends she's dying. Uh, yeah, while Tom watches from a distance. Like really. <laughs> Imagine, imagine some random woman comes to you and starts reenacting your husband's death right in front of you. Whilst wearing that outfit Whilst and that beret. That, like, it's very rude. Why was why wasn't like Dorothy like, what are you doing? You, you just why know Why are you reenacting my husband's death only three weeks previous? Obviously Jennifer d- doesn't realise that um, spoiler alert Dorothy's in on it. Mm-hmm. But you could see that a fucking mile off in this film that Dorothy's involved. Like a fucking mile off. There's no surprise in this bitch. Um, <laughs> but, but then she starts reenacting that they're like, oh, oh, Dorothy, oh but Did you that know, help with that help? But you know William is there in spirit and he's like, Oh my god, Queen fucking slay I wish I looked that fabulous whilst dying. If you wanted anyone to play you in a film, <laughs> it'd be Jennifer. Cindy, um well first of all, Tom meets up uh with Farkas and is like, you, you gotta get rid of fucking Jennifer. She's I there, know, she's right? in fucking William cosplay, if he was gay, uh act out as death. It's not on. Jennifer and Ray throw New Year's Eve party. Uh, everyone's having the best time. They are, they're having a wonderful time. <laughs> Farkas... it's, it's a strange one that she would describe her get together <laughs> on Christmas yeah. Eve as a party when it wasn't. It was a it was a dinner party uh-huh. kind of. Um, but then I don't. Th- <laughs> Did she mean to invite Pappas to? The New Year's Eve party rather than the Christmas Eve party. I mean, that doesn't really matter. He's it's fucking a dead confusing. now. He is dead. He is she, dead. I mean, she doesn't give a shit about that, by the way. Yeah, he is she, dead. He, she, he, was, he was murdered in the building less than a week previous. <laughs> murdered in her building. She had a vision of his death. Yeah. She couldn't give a shit about and that. She's fully investigating Will. They have the New Year's Eve party. A little inappropriate. But she's fully investigating William's death. She does not give a shit about Papa. She doesn't she's give like, oh, fuck that. She, she hasn't recreated it either. No. That um, was her party trick, which was interrupted yeah. by Farkas. Farkas is there disguised as a maid, and Jennifer recognises her. Yeah. Why, why <laughs> is she dressed like a, a maid, like... Like she's in the 50s. Yeah. <laughs> like a... Like Cluedo yeah. maid. <laughs> Cindy reads Jennifer to fail for all the psychic stuff. She's, oh, bitch, you just got to get over it. So Jennifer goes outside to pretend she's in a music video on a balcony. Farkas follows her out and tries to murder her, but is interrupted by a drunk party guest who tries to kiss her. A very drunk party <laughs> guest who tries to kiss her and gets a punch. She punches him in, in the return. face. Now, I was a little confused. She's not wearing a beret at this point. She's no. in a New Year's Eve party dress. This is probably still the confusion. 
is that Jennifer goes back inside, decides not to tell anyone. <laughs> she doesn't tell that anyone. The maid tried to mur- throw her off the balcony. <laughs> okay, but who's going to believe her? I mean, come on. It's okay. On a scale of believability, it's <laughs> more believable than the spirit of a dead, rich old white man has come back <laughs> and keeps telling me to solve his murder. That's true. I mean, and she kind of had a witness as well, to be well, fair. Well, kind of. That really drunk guy. Um, but, yeah, it, it's in the realm of possibility that the maid tried to throw her off the balcony. Mm-hmm. Why she decided not to tell anyone, but she continued to go with this oracle story, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Farkas finds Jennifer again and drags her into the kitchen where she tries putting Jennifer's face onto a cooker hob. Yeah. That she's stove. turned on. Yeah. And uh, everyone begins to count down to New Year's Eve. To New Year's Day, even. Uh, Jennifer manages to throw a pan of hot soup over Farkas's face before hitting her over the head with a frying pan, seemingly killing her. Okay, so number one, why was that soup still hot? <laughs> Right. It was for it's for midnight. Has it been left unattended? There was no one else in that kitchen. Don't midnight like soup. That. Shouldn't leave it unattended like that unless it's in the slow. Well, it was useful for her. It was very useful for her. Number two, who serves soup at a party? <laughs> Why are they being served soup at a New Year's Eve party? <laughs> Imagine like it's it's now nineteen eighty six. The first yeah. thing you eat in New Year's is fucking yeah, soup, a fucking bowl of soup, full of vegetables. Here we go. Oh, the. Uh... The food's on. Bowl of <laughs> Anyone fancy a bowl of soup? You're all pissed out of your face. Here you go. Here's, here's some soup. That'll help you. Just get the burger and chips on the go, silly woman. Jennifer tries telling Ray about what happened before shouting that she murdered someone. Yeah. Didn't Cindy... <laughs> also, when uh, Jennifer was having her moment in the middle of the party, Cindy was like, you need professional help. Yeah. She soon gets that professional help. She um, does, actually. Not so professional. Ray, Cindy, and Ben go to the kitchen with Jennifer, and Farkas has disappeared. She yes. survived soup to the face. It can't have been that warm. Um, no, it can't. It can't actually when we see her again, she's not burned. Her face is in shape. <laughs> true. You know? So it was just the soup itself. Yeah. That was just. <laughs> Jennifer heads to another room and asks the Oracle who's trying to kill her, and Ray's banging on the door. She's like, Not now, Ray. Please go away. The oracle just writes kill. And I was like, well, that's really fucking useful. Thanks for that. Well, yeah. yeah. It's not... <laughs> Considering how much the oracle and the spirit can do, why is it writing coherent sentences uh-huh. that they struggle with? Yeah. Like, you've actually murdered people from the other side. Mm-hmm. You know, why Why can you not write the word? <laughs> you know, my wife did it. <laughs> well, Farkas calls Tom to tell him it didn't work and informs him that she will not be dressing as a maid again because her mum had never raised no maid. Yes. Again, tearing gender apart. Yeah. Yeah. Raised a murderer, though. Raised a murderer, but yeah. know, not a maid. So Jennifer tells Cindy she wants to tell Dorothy about the maid. Cindy sends her to a doctor she knows to get help. Now, this is when the editing is out of control. Yes. Like, you don't know when the next scene's going to show up. No. So, Jennifer goes to Dr. Riker, who looks like Judge Judy. That's true. And yells at her about everything that's happened. Like, I mean... <laughs> like, she literally shouts in her face. Yes. Dr. Riker is fuming and tells her to get rid of the psychic device and assert her independence. She tells her she's going to a party in her house, uh, by her house, uh, that night. So she'll come over and they'll destroy it together. Yeah. And she does. She's like, literally seconds of, later. Yeah, she's a woman of a word. <laughs> and she goes... Uh, Jennifer doesn't answer the door, though, because she's in some sort of trance at the mirror. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, she can now get possessed by the Oracle somehow. Yeah, uh, even after the doctor's distressed. Oh, just like she was warned of. So maybe... Well, possessed, but only possessed to stare in the mirror. To stare in the mirror. And not answer the yeah. door. But even as the doctor's distressed by an uh, unseen force... That follows her to the elevator and then kills her off screen. <laughs> Jennifer's still just staring at the mirror. She is. You didn't do that scene justice at all. She attempts to walk away, Judge Judy, uh, but she hears a creature growling. So she fucking gives an 
outfit reveal. Does a spin, jacket goes flying, outfit reveal, and then she does a very melodramatic chase scene through the hallways. <laughs> she is camping it up so much. Uh, and then, yeah, she goes into a lift and the spirit finds her and she's killed off screen. Why did she feel the need to take her jacket off? Because it was the big reveal. The big reveal. Fashion, another fashion icon. And she was dressed for that party. I'm good she didn't make it there. <laughs> know, she's, yeah. she, maybe she's been to the Victorian shop as well. But you And know. FYI, no one mentions her again. No. <laughs> now, this was the first instance of someone running in this film as well. And hilarious. Anytime anyone runs in this film, yeah. it's hilarious. It is. It's so camp. So camp. Um, the the editing's at it again. Like literally, she's murdered Judge Judy, and next minute, fucking Farkas is chasing Jennifer down the road, like in a car. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? Jennifer's going about her business, she's doing a little bit of shopping, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Farkas just drives onto the pavement, start tries to run her over. It's a great hilarity, absolutely hilarious. She appears in a museum, Jennifer. Yeah. Why is Jennifer <laughs> flailing so much as she runs? Yes. She appears in a muse- museum. She goes to the museum for safety, which is very strange. I don't know where this is set. Do you Pays to get in as well. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be New York. I That's why everyone's talking like York. that. So instead of telling anyone that someone's just tried to run her over <laughs> on the pavement, with witnesses, because there's the <laughs> other cars and stuff around. Mm-hmm. She hides out in the museum instead. Yeah. Instead of telling someone or like calling the police and said, "No, I, I, literally the car's still there on the pavement. You just uh-huh. tried to run me over." She goes into the museum, <laughs> runs around, gets lost, <laughs> gets scared by one of the displays. <laughs> she screams at a display. <laughs> screams randomly at a display, but but not even like. That looked like a person. It was like a... I think it was an Aboriginal figure. Yeah. Um, screams at that. Starts getting lost in this museum. There's no one else in this museum at all. Mm-hmm. The quietest museum. Yeah. Uh, and if it's in New York, I don't think that ever happens. <laughs> She's going around. And then goes back out. And she says, someone's chasing me. Someone's trying to kill me. To the, the security guard. Yeah, and what does the security guard have? Mean. A moustache. Oh, a moustache question. Oh, the, the guy selling the tickets doesn't know it. No, he doesn't. He's the only one who doesn't. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. She's... We then cut to her. <laughs> on a stretcher. <laughs> tied to a stretcher. And put in the back of an ambulance. Her feet kicking. <laughs> as she's screaming. <laughs> Well, Sparkus is just laughing at her in a car. So Sparkus is laughing. So just outside, <laughs> this is what I don't understand. This is what I'm struggling to comprehend. <laughs> it's that this woman has gone into the museum distressed. And she's telling them that someone's trying to kill her in the museum. Yeah? hmm And their first thought is... Now, yes, it's a weird one. It's a weird situation. But it's not beyond the realms of possibility that somebody could try to murder someone in a museum. No. It, I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure it's happened. Their first thought is, this woman's crazy. Call an ambulance. <laughs> and the ambulance... And they commit her. And they commit her. And the, amb- <laughs> the ambulance that turns up... Has got, so the security, we don't see it, but the security guard's gone up and said, yeah, this woman said someone's trying to kill her in the museum. And the ambulance is like, fair point, let's, get, get, let's strap her down on a stretcher and get her to the mental institution. <laughs> Off the word of this random security guard Just in the wish museum. Just wish you needed some help. I mean, it gets the... <laughs> It gets the message across. A little extreme, but, you know, you should believe women and not randomly commit them to a psychiatric hospital. I mean, one, it's like, a strong message. Just, there's another way to go about it. But number one, like, literally outside, there had to be some witnesses 
to somebody trying to run her down yeah. on the pavement. The person who did it was a fucking part behind Still the ambulance. <laughs> she could have just pointed out, like, that's the person so, who did like, it. What did Farga, because I'm, I'm sure Farga's <laughs> got to a point where she couldn't go any further because of, like, bollards and stuff in the way. So what did Farkas do? Just reverse <laughs> just round lifted the, corner, the car up, just placed it. out and then went back. Just carried the car over like, and put it going under ambulance. What, what is going on here? It's just the idea of the ambulance coming up and going, yeah, yeah, random security guard that's never met this woman before. <laughs> that sounds... That's, she just sounds suspicious. Get her in the back of the ambulance now. Well, we've all heard what's going around about you and your fucking psychic hand. We're going to con- contact her husband? No. <laughs> No, let's just get her, get her to the mental, inter- mental institution. <laughs> well, Farkas calls up Tom to let him know what just happened. He's like, you never fucking believe this shit. And uh, Tom's like, oh, um, well, yeah, go to the hospital and kill her. And Farkas is like, are you fucking kidding me? Absolutely not. Like, I'm willing to dress as a maid and break into someone's house and, you know, do all that. I'm, I'm willing to actually murder people. Go to a hospital and murder someone. No, I don't think so. <laughs> But she tells Tom... I think she said there too many people around. Well, she tells Tom to do it himself. Yeah. Um, Back at the apartment, in a bizarre series of events, Ray is murdered by a creature ripping off his fucking head. Yeah, Ray finds the box with the oracle in, and he's absolutely fucking fuming. He's he's had enough. He's doing it himself now. He takes it to the incinerator room, goes to put it down the chute, but a large beastly hand... Comes out of the chute, grabs him, rips his head clean off. <laughs> yeah. And Ray's a goner. Yeah. And it's it's a great scene and a great effect. Yeah. Now, this is something I, I missed. So I'm going to ask you a question. When is Tom killed? Okay. So he sneaks into the hospital. He's dressed as a doctor. Um, oh, I thought that was her actual doctor. No, that was Tom. Oh, for fuck's sake. That was Tom. <laughs> Every man in this fucking film looks the same. <laughs> no, that was Tom. He approaches her bed, uh, but the skull from the TV earlier on smashes through a mirror and sends glass flying into his face and kills him. Oh, now that makes sense. Okay. We get, and he stresses the dust. Then the nurse comes in. Yeah. And she's horrified. But she's horrified thinking that Jennifer has in some way broken a mirror <laughs> and stabbed him repeatedly with mirror pieces. What do they think of this poor woman? Like <laughs> Exactly. And also the nurse didn't notice that that wasn't a real doctor. No. Like and this this is a thing for all films. So many films where people sneak in dressed as doctors. Mm-hmm. It's like, what, does no one know what their colleagues look like? Apparently not. Like we We've all seen Grey's Anatomy. Half of them have slept with the other half. Yeah. You know, they should know their colleagues. Well, Jennifer runs away from her room and the hospital staff chase her. They attach a fucking camera onto her belly and we get to see everything from the ground up when she's running. Oh, don't. It's so ridiculous. But we also see it from the hospital security man. Who has a moustache. I'm very, I'm very confused because... Is this a hospital hospital or is it a mental institution? Because it seems like an, a normal it's hospital. It's a normal hospital, but they're trying to make it look like it's a psychiatric hospital and with some harmful stereotypes wandering oh, around, um, yes, absolutely. slowing down the S- members of staff. Some very harmful stereotypes. And they do slow. And then he kind of puts his focus on them and then Jennifer gets away. It was yeah. a very confusing scene. Uh-huh. Uh, they both have low and flattering cameras strapped to them they do. as they run. Um, the running is just as camp. It is. Flailing, weird, um, Phoebe from Friends style running. <laughs> the uh, the patients are actually all played by the crew of the film. Oh, okay, lovely. The member of staff uh, finds Jennifer and tries to place her in a straitjacket because she's gone too far this time. Fucking... She smashed the mirror to pieces on her own. And just like threw the pieces at him. (laughs) In that small amount of time that they had before the nurse came back. More patients get in the way and she escapes. Dorothy meets her outside. She knew she was going to escape at that exact moment. I know. She's just waiting there for her. Dorothy is, and this is her best outfit yet. Yeah. She is given Betty Davis in Uh All About Eve. She's she's given Corey Hart wearing her sunglasses at night. Yeah. Uh, big fur coat. She's absolutely serving. She is. She's a rich bitch who's just buried her third husband. Yeah. That she gassed. Literally. Literally. 
Um, yeah, she pissed her in the back of the car with Farkas. <gasps> Farkas is in the back of the car. So, this is the big reveal that Dorothy's in with it. Oh, what a surprise. Yes. Yeah, Farkas suggests that she has her way with Jennifer before they kill her off. Uh-huh. Which is, you know, not great. Um, do you think there was any suggestion that Farkas and Dorothy were in some sort of relationship? Well, maybe. Because Dorothy was saying how much she hated making love with her husband. Uh-huh. And that she only did it for the money and to kill him off and this. But then, is there a suggestion that she had an affair with Tom? As well, who knows? Maybe they're a Tom was in, you know, potentially, yeah. They take Jennifer to the garage where William was killed and Jennifer managed to get away. Farkas, <laughs> <laughs> more running. She always manages to get away, she does she? Just like... I don't know. What, what... The power of the brace stays with her even when she's not wearing it's it. It's true. It's true. Farkas chases her with an axe, but gets too out of breath and misses whilst trying to kill her, getting her axe stuck in a cardboard box. I don't know how the fuck she missed. I that know, was no, it's just like ridiculous. <laughs> the chase continues until the ghost of William shows up. I mean, literally shows up. Literally, looking at it, actually looks like the crypt keeper. Yeah, from Tales from the Crypt. Uh, and causes Farkas to axe into a barrel of acid, which completely melts her away, her hands and her face. Yeah. Again, amazing. And then her head effects. when she's yeah. found by Dorothy. Yeah. Yeah. They're actually, really good special effects for such a low budget film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because then Dorothy finds Farkas's headless corpse. Uh, she tries to escape in her car, but the ghost of William Graham kills her in the same manner he was killed. Yeah. Um, Okay. Deserved. Deserved. Um, the whole film rendered pointless. I mean, yeah. All she if he had the ability, (laughs) (laughs) he killed Tom. Yeah. He killed Farkas. Uh huh. He killed Dorothy. Mm Hmm. Why did he need any help to get revenge? What was the point? I mean, yeah, the Oracle wasn't even there. <laughs> why is Je- Jennifer's like, well, why am I, why am I in it? Like, he, can he only follow her him? around? No, because... Oh, okay, no, to make any sense. No. Because, <laughs> like, he didn't possess her, uh, uh, apart from when she was staring in the mirror. Uh-huh. So if he'd possessed her and she'd killed them, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah? But he seemingly he was perfectly capable of doing this all himself the whole time. Uh huh. You know, planchette or no planchette. Yeah. So what? What was the point of this film? <laughs> May I ask? I uh, I don't know, but I'm glad it exists. We end the film on Jennifer sitting in her office with the Oracle working itself. She's fully embracing its powers. She is a pert zest, and she earns herself a place in the good for her cinematic universe. Yeah, technically, I mean. Helped get rid of her horrible She's husband. slaying in her final outfit, staring into the camera, end credits are over her face. Fucking owned it. Yeah. That's the Oracle. That is the Oracle. Um, yeah. Incoherent. Uh, quite messy. But real fun. Yeah. It's just, it's just fucking stupid. Yeah. And it's just a stupid fun film. I loved it. I... It's, Yeah. It was so much fun. Does it make any sense? No. Is Does it feel like a whole bunch of ideas jumbled together? Yeah. Yeah. Did I have a fun hour and a half watching it? Yeah, of course. I, I'd like to know why it exists. I, I, <laughs> I don't know if yeah. it's one of those films where a uh, video store commissioned someone to make it so they can rent it and make some money from it. Um, Maybe Robert was fed up with doing porn. Just yeah. Like, I've had enough of this. Yeah, I mean, if this is that, if this is as good as it is, imagine how good a porn is as well. I know, right? <laughs> Incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the awards. Yes. The biggest queen. I have a very specific biggest queen. I also have a very specific. It is the beret era Jennifer. It has to be the beret era Jennifer. You know, the kind you find in a secondhand store. Yeah. Uh, or a Victorian clothing store. <laughs> Biggest gasp. Uh, I have Ray's decapitation. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, Ray getting his head ripped off. Didn't didn't see it coming. Out of nowhere. 
Best dialogue I have. The board gave me another message. What am I going to do? What does it mean? <laughs> um, technically, it's best dialogue. It's... Mm, mm, <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> but that's camp. I have Dr. Riker showing up, looking like Judge Judy, only to give Jennifer a talent off, do an outfit reveal, have a short yet melodramatic chase, and then get killed off screen. Technically, mine is part of that because I put that to camp to any time anyone ran. <laughs> like anyone, it's anyone true. in the film, when they were running, it was high camp. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And for my rating, I give it seven empowering berets out of ten. Ooh. I gave it six interchangeable men with mustaches out of ten. Uh, I'd say it's not a masterpiece, trash piece, trash or basic. It's just a real fun time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's closest to a trash piece because, I mean, it is badly written and badly acted. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's still got a lot of enjoyable stuff about it. So, yeah, yeah somewhere in the middle of all of that. Uh, it's available on Video On Demand and YouTube. Oh. And if you enjoy this, I recommend checking out the Tales from the Crypt as in the TV show because it is genuinely like an episode of Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, yeah. Which is probably why they had to throw so much shit in yeah. to make it up to an hour and a half. Um, as I mentioned earlier, directed by a man, but the Sentinel. Yeah. I think is yeah takes absolutely. a very similar premise: an apartment building, and and such and takes it a little more seriously mm-hmm. but I, I think it's a fantastic film I yeah. really enjoyed The Sentinel it's real super camp as well it is. and yeah it, it, kind of similar premise yeah really better lesbian it. representation absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah and a, a really weirdly star studded cast yeah for you know a horror film but yeah if you've seen the Oracle and you're a fan let us know on social media we're Horror Court Trash over on Facebook and Instagram and Horror Court Trash on Twitter I'm Dead at Gaz92 on Letterboxd, Gazmo205 on Instagram, and GazCruz92 on Twitter. I'm Chris Barker823 on Instagram and Letterboxd. And for anyone who's been keeping up recently, it's out. The Gasp Horror Festival lineup is out there, and tickets are now on sale. So you can get them on filmfreeway.com forward slash Gasp Horror Festival forward slash tickets, or just go into our social media, Gasp Horror Fest on everything, and find the links on there. Yeah, absolutely. Big reveal. Just and like the outfit for Judge Judy. Just like the outfit, we have our we had our big reveal, and the lineup looks spectacular. Yes. Well, I mean, you can say it is spectacular. You've seen all the films, of course. <laughs> yeah, but it looks just as good as it is. Yes. So, yes. Uh, give us a rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Like and follow, and I think else. Give us a rating on Spotify. It is double episode week, so we are back on Friday celebrating more women in horror with Slumber Party Massacres original versus remake episode. Oh. And next week, we will be finishing Women in Horror Month with more female-directed horror greatness, apart from the second film we'll be talking about. Sleep... Sleepaway Camp? Slumber Party Massacre. Did I just say Sleepaway Camp for original versus remake? No. Good. I I don't know why I'm getting them mixed up. Slumber Party Massacre 2 and 3, so that's right. By Tuesday next week, we'll have discussed the entire franchise. Yeah. Which is very exciting. It is. An entire slasher franchise directed by women. That's true, which is why we can fit it into yeah. two episodes, unfortunately. Yeah, well, we will have a lot to say. Yes. Definitely. Uh, we'll be back same time, same place on Friday. Bye. Bye.